Good day everyone, I am Michael, the moderator for this webinar. I welcome everyone for today's webinar, which is History and Physical, Meeting Hospital Corps in 2023. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our presenter for today, Laura A. Dixon. Laura A. Dixon, BS, JD, RN, CPH, RM. Ms. Dixon provided patient safety and risk management, consulting and training to facilities, practitioners and staff in multiple states. Ms. Dixon has over 20 years of clinical experience in acute care facilities including critical care, coronary care, perioperative services, and pain management. I would now like to hand over the floor to the speaker. Over to you, Laura. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael, and welcome everyone to the program. As Michael said, our topic today is something that keeps cropping up, and it keeps cropping up in various forms, whether it's a deficiency or it has to be a result of a litigation. Now, we don't see too much regarding litigation, but when it does pop up, it's really brought out into the forefront. But what we're talking about today are the conditions of participation for CMS. And of course, you know, as CMS, if you want to get paid, then you have to apply and abide by all of their rules and regulations. And so why are we here today? Those of you who've had the the experience of having a CMS survey, and pretty much every hospital has, um, you don't ever want to get one of these. Well, let's go ahead and get started and just do a quick introduction with what I want to cover. Now, of course, the manual first came out in 1986. So here's the manual. This is the appendix for it. So once you go into your manual, this is what will come up. And this is the index table of contents. You will see the last date of revision for your particular manual. I talked at the beginning about deficiencies. Well, now CMS is, uh, they let us know, hey, this is what we found during our surveys. It is updated quarterly. So to access it, there's a link um, up in this corner, in the upper left corner. Now that will bring up two Excel formats. You must read them together. These are the deficiencies as of the last quarter. And you'll see here, these are the sections that we're going to be addressing today, where history and physicals are referenced. Not as many. Now, with these new tag numbers, those old tag numbers, they're gone. We won't know what those deficiencies are, unfortunately. One, we didn't make sure the surgeon had updated the H&P. Medical staff establishes through those bylaws. Again, they didn't update an H&P that was older than 30 days. Uh, those are really uh, some very broad statements. Well, real briefly, there were some changes back in 2019. CMS said any patient who undergoes surgery or a procedure, now you have the flexibility to do a pre-surgery or a procedure assessment instead of the full nose-to-toes HMP. So in taking into account, and we'll cover this in more detail here, and the reason they did this is that you know, almost 30 million Americans <laughs> have ambulatory surgeries. Overall, it has to be completed and documented after registration but before the procedure. Otherwise, you still need to document any pre-existing conditions. Uh, these changes will appear in three sections, the medical record chapter, um, it's in the medical staff chapter, and in the surgery chapter. As far as ASC, same thing, subgroups of patients that you may want to have at that HMP. Make sure everything's consistent with the overall policy. Okay, let's go on to the actual COPs, what we're talking about. I want to start with the medical staff, because that's who does the history and physicals. Now, these CMS standards, they're really closely aligned with Joint Commission. Now, it has to be, again, redone unless you have that outpatient exception. Timing? It has to be done within 24 hours after admission. So for the interpretive guidelines, again, these are the rationales and explanations directed to the surveyor. It needs to be, of course, uh, an updated entry in the record. So what if you have more than one qualified practitioner? So there's options um, for doing this. But overall, it should say HMP reviewed, patient examined. That's crucial. They also expanded the category of people who can do it. As far as the history and physical, look to do QAPI on them. You'd be surprised. They yeah, might find some issues that crop up. The surveyor, once they're on site, they will look at your bylaws. So your bylaws have to include an update and examination of the patient be done and documented 24 hours after admission or registration. Of course, the end exam would include any changes. Again, your nurse practitioner could do it if that's what you're going to do. The interpretive guidelines say, you know, use your judgment, physicians. Now, if the physician, whoever is doing the HMP, fine, no change, that's cool. The surveyor will look at the bylaw. They will look at medical records. Uh, they want to see anything that was done within, you know, past 30 days. Uh, CMS want to make sure we were really getting this idea on HMPs, and so now they repeated it in the medical records section. So there has to be evidence of an updated exam. So overall, your record, you have to have documented evidence of an assessment. Now, here's some implications. 
for this new tag number because 462 is new. So medical records, now we're going to go to surgery. These are the tag numbers for surgery. Before surgery, anything requiring anesthesia has to have a history and physical. The surveyor will look to see. So here's some clarification from CMS. It can be updated for any changes. Otherwise, um, if the practitioner finds no change, they can do that same paragraph verbiage. HMP DEM, when the patient's admitted. Critical access hospitals. <laughs> Very short section for critical access hospitals. There are only two tag numbers. One is in the record system also known as medical records, and the other is in surgery. Record systems, also known as clinical records, also known as medical records, <laughs> all are part of that HMP can be delegated. They will determine when it must be done, then they will look at records. Joint Commission is one of the more popular accrediting organizations. So the first one is the medical staff section. The medical staff, of course, they oversee everything that happens to the patient. They can allow those to do it if state law permits it, but they have to be under the supervision and when it's required for non-inpatient services. There are joint commission FAQs. So otherwise, you assess and reassess the patient. Otherwise, you update, do any changes. If the medical staff allows an assessment instead of the, um, the actual HMP, you have to have that deemed status and you do those. Every record has to have an HMP before any procedure that the medical staff determines the minimum contents. It must be done by somebody who's qualified. They talk about with Joint Commission those who don't have privileges at your particular physician. So those who are familiar uh, with the policies need to know what's in that policy and follow the policy. So medical students, they have no legal status as a provider. If you have a dentist or a podiatrist, your staff, they determine to what extent uh, they can do the HMP based upon state law, of course. Outpatients, again, you can choose to use your healthy outpatient exception. So here's the policy requirements when you have deemed status. Authentication, there's no standard that requires a dictated or transcribed be authenticated. Dictated but not transcribed. That comes up every now and then. So I want to go through a couple of the um, FAQs. If you're doing those outpatient procedure, again, medical staff defines the scope of what has to be in there. Now, the history and physical under the provision of care, the record of care chapter, the prenatal record can be used as a history and physical. Update requirements. Um, this was another FAQ. A history and physical within 30 days, updated within 24 hours after admission. Otherwise, it has to be updated before surgery when that requires anesthesia. Three sections address history and physical, medical staff, surgery, and medical record. That's why I want to start with your acute hospitals. Medical staff, under the section, the bylaws have to have that requirement for an H&P. Where CMS says must, they say shall. Time frame, same thing, within 30 days, the update must show those required elements. Patient was examined. You must have someone who is qualified to do this. That can be an oral ma maculofacial surgeon. The policy has to be um, only for those patients who have specific outpatient procedures or surgeries. Staff has to uh, make sure that the assessment is complete and documented. Surgical services, SS. The basic requirements, except in an emergency, again, you have that completed HMP. HMP is dictated, but not in the record. Medical records, uh, their services, all records have to have a history and physical within that time frame before they go to surgery. If you have specific outpatient procedures, same thing. Medical staff has a policy to identify a critical access hospital, DNV only. This was, uh, they updated this July of this year. Uh, the election that the hospital, the medical staff can't do an election for an assessment. You have to have a medical staff policy. Uh, the assessment has to be completed and documented by someone who's permitted to do it. So on the guidelines here, they have to be completed for all inpatients and outpatients. It has to be in the record 24 hours after admission before you do anything that requires surgery. If it's less than 30 days, make sure it's updated. If they're admitted only for oral and maxillofacial surgery. So surgical services, the very same thing. You can do the history and physical or your outpatient assessment. So we're going to have some extra time here. <laughs> I do have some key takeaways. This was one, uh, years and years ago, the nurses would have this checklist. So with that in mind, that again, there were no bylaws. And for anyone who listens, rural emergency hospitals, those came into being pretty recently. This only been like one or two years, and it really went into effect January of this year. Okay, folks, so with that, I want to thank everyone for attending. Michael, thank you for your assistance during the program today. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it back to you to end the program. Thank you, Laura. 
So that does conclude the session for today. Thank you everyone for participating. You may all disconnect now. Have a great day ahead. Bye-bye.